let's find out what the Dark Angels have acquired for themselves from Ritual of the Damned. Hello and welcome back to All Specs Tactics, the strategy focused 40k channel, where we're all about to get in the most out of our miniatures on the tabletop. We've looked at what the Grey Knights get out of Ritual of the Damned, but now it's time to find out what is in store for the Dark Angels. For the Sons of Caliban, it's a mix of official much needed updates and some new and interesting options. They of course have their combat doctrines and their shiny unique doctrine, the Relentless Hunt, also a whole ton of new stratagems, unique Deathwing and Ravenwing Warlord traits, a whole slew of data sheets, including a lot of updated chaplain rules, and the Phobos armor units from the Vanguard Space Marines, a data sheet for the new model Master Lazarus, who has been all primarist up, and a bunch of new relics of Caliban and special issue war gear. There's quite a bit to talk about here, so let's jump right in and see what we've got. We'll look at the core abilities first. Firstly, I'm afraid to report that Grim Resolve did not get buffed in this particular update, which in all honesty is a little bit of a shame, seeing as a lot of the other Space Marine traits did have tweaks made to them. Grim Resolve isn't too bad on its own, B-roll 1s when you're stationary, and also no more than one model can flee from a unit at a time, but it isn't really one of the strongest traits in my opinion, just because re-roll 1s are really quite easy to come by in Space Marines through a captain, they're largely quite protected to morale, and to access the shooting benefits, you need to remain stationary, which is a bit of a bummer because a lot of the time it's going to be more worth your time just to move and get optimal positioning anyway, rather than just standing still and getting these small shooting damage output. Having said all that, it isn't a bad trait, but I would have liked to see it get something else interesting. The interesting thing that they did get, however, was the Relentless Hunt Doctrine. We looked at this in the previous video this week. It's the Dark Angel's unique Devastator Doctrine that actually has a decent impact on all of their ranged weapons. Their heavy weapons and rapid fire weapons get an extra 6 inch range, and their pistol and assault weapons get an extra 3 inch range. It's interesting that you do get all of these in the Devastator Doctrine as opposed to say, Devastator and Tactical Doctrines, so it's kind of going to be an interesting trade-off if you do have a lot of Rapid Fire or Assault weapons, and you move from Devastator to Tactical, you'd gain some AP but lose some range. Of course, heavy weapons are just going to be flat better in Devastator. We talked a bit about why I think that this is so strong in the previous video. Extra range just means that pretty much every unit in your army is going to have a wider slew of targets to choose from, allowing you to optimally place your firepower to hopefully eliminate the most important enemy threats with the weaponry most suited to taking them down. Plus 6 inch range is really quite a big deal for any medium range weapons. Obviously things like bolters and plasma guns going up a bit helps, but there's a lot of powerful weapons in that bracket. Vindicated demolisher cannons at 30 inches, leviathan and storm cannons, also hampered by their short range but obscenely powerful. Things like plasma cannons, stalker bolt rifles, rapid fire hell blasters, all sorts of things can also be handy on the longer range stuff too, such as missile launchers and las cannons. If you're facing off against some enemy firepower that also has 48 inch range, it means that you could potentially outrange the enemy guns and still shoot them with yours. It's also solid on the closer range weapons too. Things like aggressors going up to 21 inches is a big jump. Flamers being able to flame out of deep strike is also useful. And particularly the Ravenwing Black Knights going up to 21 inch range with those ferocious plasma weapons is going to allow them to get shots on their chosen target more reliably. As I said previously, I think that this might be underestimated as it doesn't have quite the same amount of obvious damage boost increase compared with the Imperial Fists or Iron Hands, the other Devastator Doctrines that we know, but this will add up to more meaningful shots over the course of the game every game. A further couple of notes is that being a Devastator Doctrine you get it straight away, unlike some of the other unique chapter doctrines some of whom might have to wait till turn 2 or turn 3 before they even get to deploy their strongest tactics. Also, this does synergize quite well with Grim Resolve. Having longer range means that your units are more likely not to have to move and are more likely to trigger those reroll ones for staying still. Overall, I think it's a decently strong doctrine, possibly not the strongest out of all of the ones that we've seen before, but most certainly not the weakest. As well as having that unique doctrine, the Dark Angels have of course gained combat doctrines, which in all honesty might be more of a buff in itself than the extra range. There are a lot of weapons in the Dark Angels armory that will benefit both from the Devastator Doctrine or potentially the Tactical. In particular, I really like the idea of Ravenwing Talon Masters getting AP-2 with both their heavy bolters and assault cannons. Those things had decent anti-infantry firepower already, and now they're able to punch through armor decently well as well, and at longer range than before, 
they're only going to be more of a scary threat. Obviously, combat doctrines are going to help out with basically any unit in the entire army, with bonus points if it's a heavy weapon, as you'll get the advantage of the extra range and extra AP. Plasma cannons being AP-4 are going to like this quite a lot as well, letting them happily punch straight through enemy tough armour. As well as this, we have a confirming of Bolter Discipline and Shock Assault, the two other notable buffs that Codex Space Marines has given to us over the last year, both of which apply to a wide variety of units, but for me, helping out Deathwing Terminator squads and Ravenwing Bike squads, both of whom will be able to move and shoot their Bolters twice at 24 inches, and also have a relatively lower number of attacks and gain a lot out of Shock Assault, are particular winners of these rules. They've also clarified the ruling for successor chapters, as of course you can run a successor chapter of the Dark Angels. They essentially get all the same options, except they don't get the Relics of Caliban, they have to use the special issue war gear instead. And of course they don't get the named characters, such as Azrael or Lazarus. From a purely competitive point of view, there aren't really very many reasons to run a successor chapter over pure Dark Angels. Although one of them is to use special Forge World characters, who are tied to a certain chapter that has uncertain genetic heritage, such as Mr. Tyberos the Red Wake, who we reviewed recently on the channel. You could, for example, use a Carcaradon's chapter as a Dark Angel successor to gain access to their Warlord traits, Special Issue War Gear and Stratagems, as well as have the advantage of that Forge World character if you wanted. Finally, they reprinted the Litanies of Battle from the main codex and updated the Chaplain datasheets accordingly. We'll talk about that a bit more later though. For now, let's move on to those Stratagems. Firstly, the Dark Angels have quite a lot of reprinted stratagems from the recent Codex Space Marines. I believe that this list is exactly the same as the one in Blood of Bar, and it contains some powerful options. Duty Eternal is certainly great for Dreadnoughts, and it's great that the Dark Angels finally get access to that too. One command point to half the incoming damage characteristic of all weapons is really good, and certainly shouldn't be underestimated. We've got the three stratagems that are used to buff the various bolt rifle variants of Intercessors, Bolt Storm, the one for auto-hitting auto-bolt rifles, Rapid Fire to shoot twice with the standard bolt rifles, and Target Sighted to allow Stalker bolt rifles to snipe a character. Having extra range will make any of these options a bit more viable, particularly for the Stalker and regular bolt rifles, as they get the full 6-inch bonus from being in Devastator Doctrine. There's Veteran Intercessors for plus 1 leadership and plus 1 attack for the Intercessors. Not my favourite personally, but it's an option. Gene Wrought Might for a Primaris melee unit to get extra hits on sixes. Hunter Slayer Missile, the chance to do D3 mortal wounds with a repulsor, which can be a cheeky way to finish off tough enemy units at the end of a shooting phase. Big Guns Never Tire, the one command point one to ignore the penalties for moving and shooting with heavy weapons. In particular, this might be useful for a Relic Leviathan with Stormer Cannons or a Vindicator both of whom will be able to both move and then shoot with their 30 inch range guns. Steady advance to move and double tap with bolt discipline weapons, probably best used on intercessors, provided they have to move. Vengeance of the Machine Spirit, which is two command points, I think I've just written it wrong here as one CP. That's the one to auto explode your Storm Raven or Land Raider or Repulsor, or have one last shot with one of its guns when it dies. Transhuman Physiology is a staple of many of the Space Marine Codexes, 2 CP to have heavy weapons wound you on no more than a 4 plus is great. In particular, I like it for Dark Angels for the Deathwing, as they're toughness 4 models that you're often going to want to shoot heavy weapons at. This could make them exceptionally survivable, and potentially shrug off things like last cannon fire. Also for Deathwing, we have Fury of the First, plus 1 to hit in either the shooting or fight phase for 1 command point, is a very decent boost to damage output. Could be quite good fun to put those Maces of Redemption into Rage Mode. Hero of the Chapter, the one command point stratagem to put an additional Warlord trait onto another character. Could be quite good, particularly as we've gained another 6 in this book, and some of them are definitely worth taking. And finally, Adaptive Strategy, to allow you to change back into a previous combat doctrine. Maybe could be useful if you've decided to move forward to Tactical Doctrine to buff some Bolters, but then would prefer the extra range and heavy weapon AP perhaps later in the game. Very rarely used, but could situationally be useful. Finally, again which I've missed off this list, we've got Honored by the Rock, which is the generic stratagem to give a relic to a successor chapter out of the relics of Caliban, so it makes sure they have some access to the higher tier relics. Now let's look at those unique stratagems. First up we have High Speed Focus. This one's a Ravenwing stratagem, 
This allows you to utilize the jink special rule even if you didn't advance in the previous movement phase. So that's a 4 plus invul on an otherwise fragile and hard hitting unit for one command point that still lets you move and shoot. I think this one's a really good value stratagem. Could be great on a unit of Ravenwing Black Knights or perhaps a land speeder squadron to give them some surprise durability. You could even use this on a Talon Master or something if it got exposed or if you think that it might be shot by decent sniper fire. A good little durability boost. I really like it. Next we have Stand Firm, which is used when a Deathwing Terminator unit from your army is chosen as the target of an attack. Until the end of the phase, you increase the toughness characteristic of models in the unit by 1. Now this one is actually going to have a very wildly different effect depending on what sort of strength weapons your unit is targeted with. If you're being targeted by strength 6 or 7 weapons, then this isn't actually going to have any effect at all, as they have the same role against toughness 5 as they do against toughness 4. It's probably going to be best if you're just about to be shot by a bunch of strength 8 or 9 weapons and don't want to fork out for transhuman physiology, or if you're about to be shot by a bunch of strength 4 or strength 5 weapons. It's quite cheap for 1 CP. If you had a very big unit of Deathwing that had just deep struck in and were about to face some retaliation, it could force your opponent to waste more firepower on them. Next up is Evasive Assault, and this one is another Ravenwing one. You use it on a Ravenwing Biker unit that either has charged or was charged this turn, and it gains a 5 up inball save for that fight phase. Not quite as big a durability buff as high speed focus, but might be able to let you have another biker or two survive if they are just about to be hit by a bunch of high strength, high AP weaponry when they've been counter charged in close combat. Next we have Targeting Guidance, which is one of the strongest stratagems we have here. For one command point, use this stratagem at the start of the shooting phase. Select one enemy unit within 12 inches and visible to a Ravenwing land speeder unit from your army. Because of the way that it's written with keywords, this could apply to a Vengeance or Dark Shroud as well. When resolving an attack made by a model in a friendly Dark Angels unit against that unit, you can re-roll the hit roll. So this is one command point to give your entire Dark Angels army the new boosted Chapter Master style re-rolls against a certain unit. It has a little bit of setup, you do need at least one land speeder, and you do need it to be close to the unit, but the payoff that you get for that is just phenomenal. This will kind of auto-signal the death of that unit, provided you have a decent number of guns to throw at it, as they're going to be just so much more efficient against that one target. It's going to be strongest against something that's really big, tough, and scary. If your opponent has some sort of big Death Star unit, or if you have some Imperial Knights on the other side of the table, then it'd be particularly devastating. I honestly think that this might well be strong enough to warrant including a land speeder or two in your list if you didn't already have them. Who cares if the actual land speeder does any damage when it essentially is just providing a 33% damage buff to every single unit in your whole army. I like this one an awful lot. Next up we have Full Throttle and you use this in the movement phase after moving a Ravenwing unit in your army. You can make a second move with that Ravenwing unit though you can only advance if you haven't already advanced that turn. That unit then cannot either shoot or charge that turn. If you want repositioning, then you've got it here. This one will let a Ravenwing Biker unit go 34 inches in just one turn. Pretty crazy. Could either be used to get behind the enemy lines or get into cover out of line of sight, or potentially make a mad dash for an objective turn one, or even just move block the enemy army so they can't move out of their deployment zone turn one. Lots of good options with this one. People just don't expect most models in Warhammer 40k to move this fast. Next up we have Combined Assault, the one that was previewed from the Warhammer community page. This one's 2 CP, and you use it when you set up a Deathwing unit from your army with the Teleport Strike ability. If you set it up wholly within 6 inches of a friendly Ravenwing Biker unit, then you only have to set it up outside 6 inches of enemy models. So you could be landing your Deathwing Terminators very very close to the enemy indeed, giving them a 73% chance of making that charge even before you've used a command reroll. This is a really solid way to get your Terminators almost guaranteed into close combat and also give them better range with those Storm Bolters and perhaps be able just to shoot with heavy flamers before you charge in too. Takes a little bit of coordination again, but this will get you a near guaranteed charge when you need it. Finally, we have Outnumbered but never outmatched. This is a one command point stratagem and you use it in the fight phase when a Deathwing unit from your army is chosen to fight with. Until the end of the phase, add 1 to the attack characteristic of models in that unit, provided it is in combat with a unit with 10 or more models in it. So this is sort of your anti-horde stratagem. It is a touch of a situational one, as you're only ever going to be able to use it against certain armies. 
but it will get you a decent amount of damage output when you're carving through a horde of orcs for example, particularly if you chose to combine it with Fury of the First to get all of those extra attacks also at 2 up to hit. A good little option for when you are outnumbered and you don't want to be outmatched. The Dark Angel's unique stratagems, I'd say my favourite is probably the targeting guidance, as it's just one command point to potentially get you an inordinate amount of Chapter Master style rerolls. I also really like high speed focus for a instant 4 up on your Ravenwing bike squad, and combined assault for getting those Deathwing models exactly where they want to be. The rest are all solid options though, but just might be a little bit more situational. Next we'll look at some Warlord traits. We've got 6 new ones in total, 3 for the Deathwing and 3 for the Ravenwing. The Deathwing have Lalo the Mighty, which is a 6 inch aura ability, where friendly Deathwing units within 6 inches can be roll the wound rolls versus characters or anything that's got 8 wounds or more. Now re-rolling wound rolls is very powerful and quite hard to come by, although it does only apply to the melee weapons in the squad. To be honest, Deathwing are probably going to pulverise most light infantry in close combat, so they are really getting the full wound re-rolls against the targets that they most need to. That could perhaps be good to deep strike alongside a couple of units of Deathwing Knights and charge in to take the fight to the enemy. Next we have Inexorable, which is a defensive buff to the Deathwing Master himself, where a wound roll of 1-3 to three always fails, so it's kind of like having transhuman physiology always in effect. It's a decent defensive buff, as when you're in Terminator armour, the main thing that you have to fear is high strength, high AP weaponry, and making that stuff not wound anywhere near as much will certainly prolong the life of your character. Finally, we have Watched, which represents him having one of those little watches in the dark along, and once per game you get an automatic Deny the Witch test that has unlimited range and automatically passes. So essentially this is just take any one power that your opponent casts in the game, and that power can then go away. A little annoying that this can only ever happen once, but some armies do have certain powers that you just absolutely do not want them to get off, and it could swing the whole game whether they do, such as Craft Worlds, Doom or Jinx, or maybe Chaos Warp Time or Death Hex, just to be able to say flatly nope to that power once. It's really quite a strong ability, and maybe this one could be worth buying in against a psychic heavy foe who's carrying something like that around. After the three though, I personally prefer Lay Low the Mighty, as that gives you just a flat damage increase for nearby Deathwing squads and the Master himself. I'd say it's personally the best of the three. Moving on to the Ravenwing, we have another three. There's Impeccable Mobility, which is a 6 inch aura that affects Ravenwing units and gives them no penalty to moving and shooting with assault weapons or heavy weapons. The assault weapon one applies to the Black Knight's Plasma Talons, allowing them to advance and plug away happily. The heavy weapons could apply to any of the land speeders, but in particular I think that this could be really strong with Ravenwing Talon Masters. Generally Talon Masters will be hitting on 4s if they move and shoot, so allowing them to move and shoot for no penalty is absolutely lovely. You could have Samael alongside 2 Talon Masters flying around, with this Warlord trait on one of the Talon Masters to keep them all accurate on the move. I mean which units like to be hit most by? 72 strength 5 and 6 shots with AP-2 that hit on 3s re-rolling? The answer is really not that much. Next we have Tactically Flexible, which is an interesting one. This one gives you a 6 inch aura, and you can choose at the start of each battle round what combat doctrine the units within that 6 inch aura will be. You have to pick the same one, and it can't be the one that's already active, otherwise obviously it wouldn't take any effect. So you could say use this to put a bunch of Ravenwing bikers into Tactical Doctrine to use those AP-1 on the bolters, while the rest of your army is maintained in the Dark Angels Devastator Doctrine. Now this isn't bad and I could see how it could be applied, but I'm just not entirely sure whether or not it's worth using the entire Warlord trait for it, particularly as you will be getting a fair amount out of that Dark Angel's Warlord trait just through the extra range on every weapon. I can see its application though, probably best buffing bolters on Ravenwing bikers, or perhaps the shooting and then melee of Black Knights. Finally we have another strong one, which is Outrider. The Warlord and one Ravenwing unit can make a 12 inch pre-game move, it has to end its move greater than 9 inches away from the enemy, and you can't advance during that move. This is one that will let your Black Knight squad get thrown straight up the battlefield, or ready to make a nasty mess of whatever they want to on turn 1. Probably best if you're going first, though I could see it being handy to scoot some Black Knights out of line of sight if you do happen to be going second. So some really strong options for both of them there. I personally prefer the Ravenwing ones to the Deathwings myself, particularly that move and shoot Talonmaster and Samael option. 
though I'm certain that people will definitely be having fun with that Black Knight moving before the game shenanigans. Don't forget that you can have more than one wall or trade with Hero of the Chapter now, so you could have multiple ones of these running at the same time. Next, let's get on to Relics of Caliban. We have six new Relics of Caliban, and sticking with the theme of the book, they're all about buffing the Deathwing and Ravenwing. And then we have the options of the special issue war gear, which are relics that can be taken by successor chapters for no penalty. First of all, we have the Blade of Burden, which buffs a Deathwing power sword with strength plus 2, AP minus 4, damage 2, and if you roll a modified 6 on the wound roll, the target suffers 2 mortal wounds and the attack sequence ends. It's not too bad to be honest, though it has to be said it isn't enormously better than a power fist. You trade out the minus 1 to hit for the strength 8. It will certainly be decent at chewing through Primaris Marines, but might struggle a bit more against enemy heavy hitters, particularly losing out to the Power Fist on anything toughness 7 or 8. Next is Reliquary of the Repentant for a Ravenwing Biker model, which gives enemy units within 3 inches minus 1 to their invul saves. Could be a decent one to buy in if you are playing against an army that relies on invul saves and you happen to have a Ravenwing Biker character, such as a Ravenwing Ancient. In particular, this could be very nasty against things like Demons, those Playbearer Hordes won't be half as survivable if this guy trots up to right next to them, and they're only saving on 6 of Invuls. Likewise, it could help you out against other tough Invul units, such as Necron Wraiths, or Space Marines bearing Storm Shields. Definitely not something that I'd use every single game, but certainly a decent pickup. Next, we have a Deathwing Ancient Unique Banner, which looks remarkably similar to the Blood Angel's Standard of Sacrifice. Deathwing Ancient only, and it's a 5 plus fill no pain aura to models within 6 inches of the Ancient. Note that that's models, not units, so that actually means that you have to keep quite close to the banner bearer to be able to use this very nice defensive buff. It only works on Deathwing, so you're going to need to deep strike it alongside some Deathwing Terminators, and then if you are charging in, both the Deathwing and this model are going to have to make their charge if you want to keep the buff up. It is a seriously decent buff to the durability of two wound models, but it does require more careful positioning than some. Next we have Corvus Oculus. This one's another Talon Master buffing relic, and it gives their weapons plus 6 inch range and plus 1 to the hit roll. Simple and murderously effective. With the Dark Angel's unique Devastator Doctrine, that means that this Talon Master's Assault Cannon will be a mighty 36 inch range, and the Heavy Bolter will be a whopping 48 inch range. You could perhaps put this one on the Talon Master at the back of your little Talon Master bubble if you are running a few, allowing him to drop back a fair bit and be safe in the knowledge that he's got a lot more range than his compatriots. You could certainly combine this with the Warlord trait that we mentioned earlier, meaning that this particular Talon Master will be shooting just as well as Samael, and they'll both be hitting on twos re-rolling on the move. Very scary. Next we have the Key of Acrobail, a Deathwing character model only, and it gives them a very simple, uncomplicated, plus one strength and plus one attack. Could be good for building yourself a little Deathwing Smash Captain, hitting on strength 10 with a Thunder Hammer or Power Fist, with an extra attack is never going to go down too badly. Finally, we have the Standard of the Hum for Giving Hunt, a banner for the Ravenwing Ancient, that gives plus one to advance and charge rolls within six inches of him. Could be a useful one to have along for a Black Knight squad that's hurtling up the battlefield to hit you with Corvus Hammers. Now we move on to the special issue war gear section. We have the usual old favourites here, Artificer Armour, Mastercrafted Weapon, Digital Weapons and Adamantine Mantle. The Artificer Armour will give you a 2-up save and a 5-up invul, usually best used on more fragile characters such as librarians to give them some protection that they wouldn't otherwise have. The Mastercrafted Weapon, the lovely plus 1 damage to your weapon's attack profile, often handier of getting a d3 plus 1 power fist or a damage 4 thunder hammer. The digital weapons are usually going to be inferior to a master crafted weapon, giving an additional attack that inflicts a mortal wound if you hit with it, and the adamantine mantle will give you a 5 up feel no pain type save to make your character harder to remove. That one could be quite interesting on a talent master actually as a decent survivability buff. In terms of unique options, we've got the arbiter's gaze, which ignores ballistic skill modifiers and gives you full ballistic skill overwatch. Typically, special characters don't really have the strongest shooting attacks. Again, probably the logical choice would be a Talon Master, as he's a character armed with some actual serious firepower. This would allow your Talon Master to move and shoot without the ballistic skill penalty for moving and firing heavy weapons, and also ignore any ballistic skill penalties that the enemy was opposing on him to boot, say if he did want to try and swat a pesky Eldar flyer. 
and four ballistic skill overwatch never hurts when you've got 18 shots. This one's certainly a solid option for a lone talon master, and I think it competes well with Corvus Oculus. They're both similarly strong. Next we have Angel's Ambit. I had to look up what an ambit was. Apparently it sounds like the limits or restrictions, and it's quite appropriately named because it's an addition to the range of the aura abilities of that model. If you want a 9 inch aura captain or talon master, then here you are. Unfortunately, the Dark Angels don't have a chapter master stratagem, and of course you can't give relics to Azrael or anyone, which is a bit of a shame to be honest, and does limit the ability of this one somewhat, as ideally you want it on a chapter master. Finally, we have the unique relic bolts that you can choose to give one of your Dark Angels with. To be honest, the bolts of judgment aren't particularly overwhelming. You make a single AP2 damage 3 shot that wounds on a 2 up if you're not targeting a monster or vehicle. Not awful to be honest, but it's not really anything comparable with some of the other relics. Typically I'd rather just buff the melee capacity of most characters with something like a mastercrafted weapon and leave your actual shooting to battle line units that are actually good at it rather than trying to make a character into something that he isn't. So overall my favourite out of these relics is probably Corvus Oculus, as you're getting a decent amount of boosted firepower for that relic slot. I also like the key of Acrobail, standard of the Unforgiving Hunt, and the Reliquary of the Repentant, provided you're fighting someone who has invul saves. Next we move on to the data sheets that we find in this book. Firstly, we have updated data sheets for the Chaplains and Interrogator Chaplain, and Chaplain Asmodai. Unfortunately, despite being iconic units of the Dark Angels, none of these can know two litanies like the Master of Sanctity can from the generic Codex Space Marines. I was sort of hoping the Interrogator Chaplain might be able to know two and cast two, but unfortunately he can't. Asmodai does know two different litanies from the litanies of battle, although Games Workshop did take back the extra litany that Lamartes and Astarath knew from Blood of Bar. So I would look out for an FAQ to see if this guy actually keeps his extra litany. The Dark Angels have Stoic Prosecution, which is a unique litany that only they can access. And to be honest, it's really quite a strong one. Stoic Prosecution will allow a unit to shoot as if stationary, and you can use it on one infantry unit within 6 inches of the chaplain. This one was shown to us by Games Workshop in the Warhammer community preview, and as per most shoot as if stationary abilities, Aggressors get the, probably the most out of this, as they literally double their shooting if they remain stationary, and also access Grim Resolve to reroll their ones to hit in the shooting phase. This is doubly potent with their 21 inch range Bolt Storm Gauntlets as per the Devastator Doctrine, and it's a nice ability overall. Could also be great on any units moving and shooting with heavy weapons, as they'll get to ignore the move and shoot penalty and also reroll ones, just like their little Iron Hands and potentially some bolt rifle intercessors, moving and double tapping with the bolt discipline rule. We've also got reprints of the data sheets for the Primaris Master and the Master in Phobos armor, also the Phobos Librarian, Phobos Lieutenant, and some Vanguard Space Marines. Unfortunately, there's no updated data sheet for Azrael, so they haven't chosen to update his Chapter Master style rerolls to be full rerolls to hit, and if it follows the same pattern as Blood of Baal, He's not likely to get any updates to his reroll ability when the FAQ of this book comes out. Finally though, we have Master Lazarus, the new and shiny Primaris miniature that's come out alongside this book. So let's take a look at his datasheet. Master Lazarus is an HQ choice for Dark Angels, and his points cost are not included in this book, due to an oversight on Games Workshop's part. Fortunately, I had to look over on the Warhammer community sites before making this review. And at the bottom of the pre-orders for Ritual of the Damned, they've included his points cost, which is 105 points. So he's quite a cheap character, to be honest. So what do you get for your investment? He's got a 6-inch movement, weapon skill and ballistic skill 2 up, strength and toughness 4, 6 wounds, 5 attacks, leadership 9 and a 3 up save, and of course a 4 up involve from his iron halo. So pretty much your typical Primaris Master stat line there. He has Enmity's Edge and Frag and Crack Grenades and also a bolt pistol. I think that the model looks really quite nice. I like that snazzy helm that he has in particular. I wonder if there'll be an option to include it on his head and not just in his hand. Anyway, Enmity's Edge is a decent buffed power sword, which will be hitting at strength plus 2, AP minus 4, and damage D3. Not so different from the Relic Deathwing Blade that we saw earlier in the video. Instead of a mortal wound ability though, this guy gets a buff against Psychers, where if he's fighting a Psyker in close combat, he can re-roll the wound roll and re-roll the damage roll. 
He has the Angel of Death and Inner Circle abilities, and his fancy hat, the Spirit Shield Helm, will provide a 5 plus Feel No Pain type save to ignore wounds to all Dark Angels units within 6 inches. It only works on mortal wounds, however, so it's going to be the best against psychic heavy armies, such as all of those Grey Knights and Thousand Sons, which I'm sure we're getting a new lease of life at the moment. He's got your standard Rites of Battle reroll, reroll hits a 1 with that, and finally he has Intractable Will, which means that when he is slain within 1 inches of enemy units, he can immediately fight again as if it were the fight phase, before being removed from play. And you can't use Only in Death as Duty End on him as well, as that would have him fighting twice when he dies, which I can only presume would be a bit heroic even for him. So overall, Master Lazarus has a decent fighty all-round primary stat line, and some nice additional abilities baked into him, for not too many more points than your standard captain. Whether or not he outcompetes other options, such as Smash Captains, Deathwing Masters, or Talon Masters, is a bit of another question, but I think that he does do quite well in terms of being a decent buff captain, with a surprisingly effective melee profile, and some interesting anti psycho abilities. I looked at him as an option as a buffing captain, that can easily punch above his weight. So overall, I think that's a decent update for the Dark Angels. Maybe not quite so much for their Green Wing varieties. Almost all of the buffs seem to be centred around the Dark Angels, Raven Wing and Death Wing. Though to be fair, most of the Dark Angels' unique units do come from these unique companies. Let me know your thoughts on these guys down in the comments below, and any obvious synergies that I might have missed. Overall, with the Combat Doctrines and their unique one, I think that the Dark Angels are decently stronger, and I certainly think that we'll be seeing a lot more Ravenwing units on the table, perhaps supported by a few Deathwing squads to deep strike in, and wreak some havoc. Feel free to subscribe to Allspets Tactics if you'd like to see more. I would like to cover some Dark Angels unit over the next couple of weeks, and I certainly will do if the schedule permits. I also have a Patreon page that helps keep the channel afloat. If you're enjoying these reviews, then please feel free to leave any support that you'd like there. And of course, a big thank you to those already helping out the channel. Thanks very much for listening. I'll hope to see you guys in the next video.